like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes consists of the following format. One will have a brief announcements period. Two will have the speaker will speak. Then we'll have a question and answer period. Then followed by a rebuttal period. Now, tonight's speaker will be uh, David Ramsey Steele, Orwell, your Orwell, a worldview on the slab. David Ramsey Steele is a classical liberal and critical rationalist speaker and writer. Everyone has read George Orwell's 1984 and Animal Farm or seen the movies. Most people have some idea that about what George Orwell believed and what he was trying to say. In his new book, Orwell, Your Orwell, A Worldview on a Slab, David Ramsey Steele has carefully analyzed everything Orwell wrote and uncovered Orwell's actual beliefs on social and political and political matters. The conclusions are surprising and sometimes shocking. All previously published accounts of Orwell's views contain some serious errors. Dr. Steele gives us the first accurate picture of what Orwell thought about vital political issues. Orwell liked to portray himself as a lone dissident or persecuted heretic. In fact, he was neither. His political views were commonplace and standard for the time. He was a representative figure of the 1930s left, a true believer in the orthodoxies of 1930s socialism. In his short life, Orwell underwent several sudden conversions, such as his overnight switch in August 1939 from being firstly anti-war to being enthusiastically pro-war. He also clung to some big positions, such as his opposition to the British Empire, to totalitarianism, to homosexuality, and to birth control. Dr. Steele explains both the dangers and the continuities. As well as recovering Orwell's beliefs from many misconceptions, Dr. Steele criticizes and evaluates these beliefs. Where was Orwell was where was Orwell right and where was he wrong about socialism, capitalism, democracy, totalitarianism, or the purpose of human life? Right. Let's welcome our speaker again tonight, Mr. David Ramsey Steele. Let's give him a big round of applause. I'll have a big Come on guys, you can do better than this. He's always good, Charlie. Members of the human species, and anybody else who may be paying attention. Um, so, I recently read somebody objecting strongly to people who start sentences with so. I quite like it. Um, so, I wrote this book on Orwell. Um, knocked it off in a couple of weekends when there wasn't much on TV. Um, <laughs> There are three things I do in this book. Uh, I try, and the, the biggest, the most important thing I do is I try to give an accurate picture of Orwell's beliefs, that is to say, his ideological outlook, his beliefs on such matters as capitalism, socialism, democracy, totalitarianism, sex. He had views on that. Um, and that's the most important thing I do in the book, and I try to give an accurate picture of what Orwell believed. And I think I've succeeded, and I, this is the first accurate picture of what Orwell believed. All previous accounts, all previous published accounts of what Orwell believed contain serious errors, either of commission or of omission. Secondly, what I do is I try to show how Orwell's beliefs relate to other beliefs, either people who lived contemporaneously with him or earlier. So I try to show what his beliefs were in the context of evolving systems of beliefs. Um, the third thing I do is I sometimes criticize some of these beliefs and show why I think they're right or wrong. Uh, now, when it comes to the third thing, you can detect that I have my own opinions on things. I'm a libertarian or classical liberal, means the same thing. Um, and um, so you might disagree with some of my views when I criticize. But 
If you're surprised or shocked or offended by what I say or well believe, then that is something that's completely non-partisan. Uh, libertarians are just as likely to be surprised and shocked and offended by what I say or well believe as socialists or conservatives or anybody else. Excuse um, me, sorry, honey. So it's Tim's an objective oh, matter of fact to determine sorry. what all well believe. Do you have and I think work? that's the most important oh, part of my book. Yeah. Now, yeah. why is it, if I'm right, why is it that people get all well wrong? Why do people uh, attribute views to Orwell that he didn't have? Uh, there are various reasons, and we may go into them later in questions and discussion. Um, but I think one of the reasons is that Orwell sometimes changed his mind, sometimes about important matters, sometimes very suddenly. Uh, and people come to Orwell with certain, they've read, most people have read Animal Farm in 1984 before they've read anything else. They come to Orwell with a picture of what they think Orwell believed, and then they overlook the fact that Orwell dramatically changed his mind on several occasions. So what I'm going to do, by way of giving you a taste of what's in this book, this isn't the way the book's laid out, I'm going to lay it out differently now. I'm going to look at five occasions where Orwell changed his mind, where he made decisions that changed his outlook. Uh, let me just briefly say what these are. The first is his decision to quit the Imperial Police Force and dedicate himself to life as a writer. Right, that was in 1927. Um, the second was his conversion to socialism. From being an anti-socialist, he became a socialist in the middle of 1936, when he was writing a book called The Road to Wigan Pier. The third was his decision to become an anti-Stalinist revolutionary. Uh, uh, and I'll explain what that means later. That happened in the middle of 1937, when he was in Spain, or perhaps I should say in Catalonia, which may not be part of Spain, but uh, yeah. yeah. um, <clears throat> Then there is his sudden switch from being opposed to the coming war so in the years up to the Second World War, which as a, an English person, I think began in the, in, uh, on the 3rd of September 1939. Of course, you're Americans and you think it began a couple of years later. Um, everybody knew this war was coming, uh, or was highly likely. Uh, and Orwell was very much opposed to supporting this war. He took a position of opposition to the war. Uh, and then... He switched very suddenly to being a strong supporter of the war, about a week before the war actually started. Uh, so that's a very considerable shift, uh, very sudden, and had far-reaching implications. Um, and then finally, I want to look at the changes in his out. This is not so sudden, it's more gradual, but it's still only in a few years the changes in Orwell's outlook because of his experience during the Second World War. So I'm looking here at the, uh, at the changes that occurred between about 1942 and 1945, where he changed his view on a number of key questions, partly because he had to, because things he'd been sure were going to happen had not happened. Um, so let's look at the, the, each of these uh, in a bit more de uh, detail. So. In 1927, when he was 24 years old, Orwell came back from Burma, which was then part of the British Empire. Now, remember, we're talking about a time when two-fifths of the Earth's land surface was colored pink, meaning that it was part of the British Empire. Uh, and Orwell was born in India. Uh, he was a child of the empire. Uh, he grew up in a society where people thought that the empire would last forever, many people did, and certainly would last for hundreds of years. Um, he went out to Burma, which was then administratively part of India, uh, and became a police officer in Burma. So every sort of important region or town in Burma had 
a chief of police who was British, and then several native Burmese inspectors who would be reporting to that person, and then hundreds of native constables who would be reporting to those native inspectors. So he was the head guy, and if you were a Brit and you joined the Imperial Police Force, you were automatically the head guy in some region of the empire. So he was the head of a town police force in Burma. He was there for five years. Actually, the first year was training, mainly military-type training. Um, he came back on leave in 1927, after five years, and he told his astonished and appalled family that he wasn't going to go back to Burma. He was going to become a writer, of all things. Um, <clears throat> Uh, that you can imagine their reaction. Um, I don't know whether he told them immediately what kind of a writer he was going to become. He, what he was going to do was, he was going to live among tramps and hobos and down and outs and write about his experiences. Now this was, uh, this, is, uh, this was at the time, um, a very respectable literary tradition. You have Roughing It by Mark Twain, you have People of the Abyss by Jack London, you have Autobiography of a Super Tramp by W.H. Davis, uh, The Amateur Immigrant by Robert Louis Stevenson. This was, a, this was a recognized genre. So Orwell was going to spend a lot of time with, actually, I say tramps. I, when I came to the United States, I realized that in the United States, tramp means something different. It, it means um, a lady who doesn't always remember to keep her legs tightly crossed. Um, and uh, but so in Britain, tramp means what you would say here, hobo. So he lives with hobos uh, and um, writes up his, uh, his life with the hobos and uh, writes articles. This is his beginning as a writer. Now, um, <clears throat> I should say this, that Orwell's family was not wealthy, but they were very, very respectable. And he had got a scholarship to a public school. Now, footnote, in Britain, public school means elite private school. That's the meaning of the term public school in Britain. Uh, what Americans call a public school, Brits would call a state school. And he, in fact, got a scholarship to the top public school, the one where three quarters of the British government came from, Eton. Uh, and so, what, one thing you have to understand about Orwell is that he was automatically a member of the ruling class in Britain because he'd been to Eton. He was an old Etonian. Uh, that meant automatically, sort of, um, uh, <coughs> ex officio, you were a member of the ruling class. Uh, so, instead of going to university after Eton, uh, he went to into the Imperial Police Force, and this was a, like a family tradition. His father had been an Imperial civil servant in India. Um, his father's job as a civil servant in India was to inspect the opium crop, uh, which was going to be exported to China, and to make sure the quality was okay. Uh, so that was, that was uh, this is one of the things the British Empire uh, got up to, and it's um, very tolerant and uh, um, multifaceted, um, existence. So, <clears throat> Orwell was quite serious about being a writer, and he devoted many hours every day, when he wasn't actually living with hobos, um, <clears throat> to, um, to his writing, the ty typewriter, cl manual typewriter, clacking away all the time. Um, and at first he just wrote um, little pieces for uh, magazines and journals and uh, little book reviews, little articles, uh, little uh, pieces. Then he got more ambitious. Uh, and he, he was very dedicated and industrious as a writer. From 1933 until 1940, each of those years, he published one new book. Four of them were novels, four of them were non-fiction. Although I have to say here that my theory is that a great deal of Orwell's non-fiction is really fiction. Uh, but that's 
a subordinate point we don't have to pursue right now. But he wrote eight, so he, he wrote a book a year from 1933 to 1940. Um, and this, despite the fact that he spent six months of that time in the trenches fighting in Spain, he spent um, uh, several months wandering with, with his wife visiting uh, Moro French Morocco for his health. He always had lung trouble, TB, and he was one of the things people said, get to a warm, dry climate, so on this occasion he did. Um, and uh, he had other things that uh, occupied his time and distracted him, uh, but despite that he did one book a year for eight years, uh, from, from uh, 1933 to 1940. Um, the first book he did was called Down and Out in Paris and London. Uh, he'd gone to Paris, he'd run out of money, actually he'd been swindled out of money by a girlfriend that he called. When he came to novelize this in Down and Out in Paris and London, he made it uh, a male friend, but, um, uh, and then he'd lived the life of um, a very low paid worker. He was a washer up in restaurants. Uh, and he described what that was like, and also um, other things about the underbelly of restaurants. Old cuisine in Paris was not necessarily all that clean, uh, and, all that, and what went on behind the scenes was not always uh, as glamorous as it appeared on the surface. So, um, so this was all well the writer, uh, and. Um, he chose the name Orwell, his real name was Eric Blair, B-L-A-I-R. Uh, he chose the name Orwell for his first book. Um, and I think he had the idea, well, if the book is a terrible failure, I can come up with another name. But of course, <laughs> uh, nothing is as permanent as the temporary. And uh, he was George Orwell from then on. Uh, George Orwell was his pen name. The name on his gravestone is Eric Arthur Blair. Uh, but it was more than a pen name. Generally speaking, those people who met him from 1933 on and made his acquaintance knew him as George Orwell. Uh, and um, his, his first wife died suddenly, uh, and it, he, he married at the very end of his life when he knew he was going to die. Um, and uh, his second wife always called herself, she was Sonia Brownell, she always called herself Sonia Orwell. So, the name Orwell was more than just a pen name. Uh, however, the theory you meet in some books that these are two different aspects of his personality or two different worldviews, that's completely wrong. That's completely wrong. Uh, it, it was, it, it was a, the name Orwell uh, was adopted uh, as a pseudonym, as a, a nom de plume for down and out in Paris and London. Um, and, you know, Orwell, uh, as we may come on to later. Orwell was um, very committed to manliness. He uh, was against, ideologically and intellectually opposed to homosexuality. He was opposed to birth control, although conveniently he was sterile. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, the name George Orwell sounds very masculine. The name Eric Blair sounds a bit limp-wristed, right? So, um, so he, he hated the name Eric Blair. He hated the Blair because at public school he's been told that the model of clean living austerity were the Scots. And Blair is, um, like Ramsey and like Steele, uh, a lowland Scots name. Uh, he hated the name Eric because it was uh, associated with the Victorian kind of books for uh, clean living young people. A young man that he'd uh, been weaned on. Uh, so he didn't like the name Eric Blair at all, he hated it. Uh, so he was more comfortable with George Orwell. Um, <clears throat> now, prior to, prior to 1936, uh, Orwell was not a socialist. He had many views that were compatible with the left. He was against the British Empire. He came back from Burma against the British Empire. Um, but he wasn't a socialist, he, and uh, he, he actually made some anti-socialist statements. Now, the, the clearest way to see this is to look at the book 
uh, Keep the Aspidistra Flying, which is a, the last novel he wrote before he became a socialist. And it's got some clear anti-socialist uh, messages in it. Now, of course, you always have to be have to understand that what an author makes characters say in a work of fiction is not necessarily what the author believes. Uh, and even what the narrator in a work of fiction says is not necessarily what the author believes. But the classic case, of course, is Polonius, this above all to thine own self be true, which is not something Shakespeare or whoever wrote the Shakespeare canon uh, believed in. It was his picture of a conservative-minded person who brought in cliches. And he's, attri he's attributing that worldview to Polonius. It's not the author of the play who is, who is saying that, but the character Polonius. So you have to be very careful when you use a word of fiction to document what a person's um, ideological, political outlook is. However, Orwell was, to cut a long story short, Orwell was not the kind of person who would use irony in his narrative voice. The, the narrator in Keep the Aspidistra Flying is clearly Orwell. Uh, and uh, there is no way to interpret the anti-socialist sentiments in Keep the Aspidistra Flying except as anti-socialist sentiments. Um, so, what happened um, in 1935 was that Orwell was commissioned to go to the north of England, uh, yeah. live and uh, visit the poor, yeah, visit the poorest people minutes. in the north of England, and then write a book about it. Now, Everything's cooking. here I have to explain something. You put 30 orders that, in at um, once, so it's going to take one minute. In the 1920s, when many parts of the world had a boom, Britain had a slump. Uh, Britain was in slump in the 1920s. And then, when the 1930s came along, the slump got worse. Uh, despite that, most of the British population experienced increases in real income in the 1930s. So what you had was a di division of the population. There was something called the distressed areas, capital D, capital A, was talked about all the time in the 30s. Uh, and the rest of Britain, which was much more prosperous and much more, and, and where most people were better off. The southeast of England, most people were better off than they had ever been. Uh, and they read newspaper articles about the distressed areas, which were the old industrial shipbuilding areas, where times were very hard, where there, where, where there were a lot of slums and where conditions were terrible. Uh, and of course, it was particularly scandalous that these terrible conditions were in Britain. People felt ashamed of this. So um, the distressed areas were uh, <coughs> Yorkshire, parts of Yorkshire, parts of Lancashire, Northern Ireland, um, Tyneside, uh, and um, Glasgow, uh, Clydeside. So they, they were the distressed areas. The conditions were. People were poor, conditions were very bad. Uh, so Orwell, who spent most of his life in the southeast of England, uh, and that was the part, the Thames Valley was the, was the sort of part of Britain that he knew well. He paid a visit to the worst areas of Yorkshire and Lancashire uh, at the end of 35, beginning of 36, with the idea of writing a book about this which would be uh, his account of how terrible things were in the distressed areas. Uh, when he came back to London, uh, the, the, south, uh, the home counties, the southeast of England, he actually gave a talk entitled, An Outsider Looks at the Distressed Areas, which is a very accurate, a, 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 an accurate description of the book, The Road to Wigan Pier, or the first part of The Road to Wigan Pier. Now, what Orwell did was he decided that this trip to the port to visit the poor and see how they were living in the north of England was going to determine him, he was going to determine at that time whether to become a socialist or not. It was a big commitment. He was going to change his, from being an anti-socialist to being a socialist. Um, and the book he eventually completed, it took him 10 months to write. Uh, the, book, the first is in two parts. The first part, of almost exactly equal length. The first part is all about living conditions in the, north, in the north of England, how terrible they are. The second part is his views on socialism, 
uh, and his views on everything, actually. His view, so, one of the consequences of this is that we suddenly have a very complete picture, in Orwell's words, of his own views. Uh, prior to 1936, we've got to do a lot of guesswork and reconstruct what his views might be, and there's a certain amount of uncertainty. But with the, road, the second half of the road to Wikipedia, he's laying out, this is what I think about the world. These are my correct views on everything. Um, and um, so he's a socialist, and uh, he's, a new, he's a new convert to socialism. And he's a socialist who spends a lot of time in the second half of the road to Wikipedia attacking socialists because he says they're going about things in the wrong way. The microphone went down, so you have to project even louder for about so, four minutes. For four minutes? Bring, bring the mic closer. It's completely it, 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 The mic went out. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. The folks in the back can't hear as well. Give me the microphone fixed here. There's a set of batteries. We're switching it over now. Give us a please be patient with us for a So should, should I wait? If you don't mind. I don't mind, no. Orwell can wait. Answer one question, maybe? Sure. <laughs> Did Orwell make any money from these books? Uh, I mean, well, he made people. a lot of money at the end of his life. He had two big hits at the end of his life, Animal Farm in 1984. Um, Excuse me, please. The books he wrote earlier, he made some money from. He, it wasn't a loser. Uh, he, and he was able to support himself from his writing. Oh. Uh, but only just. I mean, he was he was <clears throat> he was not wealthy until Animal Farm. Uh, but he, he was making enough to get by on writing. Um, yeah, but he wrote. Uh, see, he wrote he wrote a huge number of articles for newspapers, magazines, and they paid him at like a, a certain small amount that might be enough to keep him for a week. You know. Um, and so, um, better? No. Okay, so it's working again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that, better. Better. So should I backtrack and say what I just no. said again? No. Yes. No. Or keep on. Yes. Or just go on? Just keep on. Just so, on. Start from the beginning. Start from the beginning, <laughs> right, right, I'll do that. So, uh, so the road to Wigan Pier, uh, the second half of the road to Wigan Pier is very crucial because Orwell is suddenly telling you all about what he thinks about the world. And not only is he, a, is he a convert to socialism, he's also a convert to politics, in the sense that prior to 1936, he's not primarily a political person. He's got political views, he's against the British Empire, that sort of thing. Uh, but, and he's against socialism, as he says. Um, but he's not, he's not consumed with political, with political ideas. From 1936 on, not only is he a socialist, but he's consumed with political ideas. He's totally preoccupied with this issue of fighting fascism, establishing democratic socialism, uh, fighting totalitarianism, fighting the Communist Party. All these ideas are very central to his, to his thinking after, from 1936 on, but not before. Uh, so, the second half of the road to Wigan Pier tells you in considerable detail, really, what he thinks about the world. Um, and it, <clears throat> he thinks that socialism is correct, uh, but socialists are bungling it. And the reason he thinks this is because he's against progress, and he's against industry, and he's against modern technology, or as he puts it, he's against the machine. This is clearly there in the second half of the road to Wikipedia. And he thinks the problem with the way socialists put their message is they lay too much emphasis on industry. So, one of the interesting things about medium with fries the 1920s and 1930s is that in the 1920s Give me a minute, and 1930s, dear. Get the out. most intellectuals who have a clearly defined political position 
a left. But most intellectuals who are not political, particularly, who are primarily interested in the arts, are right wing. You know, if you think about people who were being hailed by the avant garde intellectuals in the 30s and in the 20s, for that matter, as the leading artists of the time, W.B. Yeats, T.S. Eliot, D.H. Lawrence, people like this, they're all people who are reactionaries in their outlook. Um, and my theory to account for this is that socialist ideas suffered a mortal intellectual blow in the 1880s and 1890s, that there was a, a, a reaction among intellectuals against socialism in the 1880s and 1890s. And this reaction took a particular form. It took the form not of saying there is something better than socialism, but in being disillusioned with all talk of progress or rationality. There's a disenchantment with progress and rationality, which we now call fin de siècle, French for end of century. Um, and this fin de siècle outlook pervades intellectuals at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, and it really hits home in the 1920s. And Orwell, prior to 1936, had been a non-political intellectual. He'd imbibed all this uh, anti-progress ideology. Uh, and now he joined, he's decided to be a socialist. Uh, and he criticizes the socialists from the standpoint of this post-socialist ideology that he's picked up, um, which was actually quite common. So it's as if, it's as if someone like T.S. Eliot or D.H. Lawrence was to write a lot of criticisms of socialism, because they didn't, but this is what they would have written. <laughs> this is what Orwell thinks anyway. So he's, he's attacking so socialists for being too machine-oriented. Uh, so that's, that's the situation in, um, in the second half of the road to Wing Pier. Now, um, <clears throat> the road to Wigan Pier was published in the Left Book Club. The Left Book Club was the great success the Communist Party had in trying to get control of the British left. Um, the th it, when you say a book club, the normal setup for a book club is the book club picks books from different publishers, buys in bulk from them, and then issues them as book club editions. The, the left book club wasn't like that. It was one publisher, Victor Galanis. Uh, and uh, the Galantz firm had a lot of money at the time because of the um, Lord Peter Whimsey uh, detective stories that they published. Uh, so they had money to play with. Uh, and Galantz was a very, con a very convinced socialist and a, and a strong fellow traveller of the Communist Party. Um, so he set up the Left Book Club, and if you uh, the book, everything in the Left Book Club was published by Galantz. Um, and, there was, and it was set up with a, a triumvirate of three people who had to agree on each new title in the, in the book club. They were Victor Delance, the, uh, the owner of the company, um, Harold Lasky, and um, John Strachey. So all, um, all close fellow travellers of the Communist Party. In fact, Strachey is the only case known to me in Britain where he applied to join the Communist Party and they declined his application. They wouldn't let him join. Uh, and, um, that, I think that was more common in other countries. Uh, quite uncommon in Britain. But um, uh, Strachey, uh, after they declined his, uh, his application, he kept on writing books that put the Communist Party line. And he was a much more able writer than anyone in the Communist Party. And the books he wrote throughout the 30s, he wrote, I haven't counted them all up, but it must have been more than one a year, uh, were very influential. The, the one that's the most influential, is worth reading actually, is The Coming Struggle for Power. And it gives the Communist Party view, without saying it's the Communist Party view, it just gives this as a Marxist view. Uh, uh, so Strachey was uh, as, as strong a fellow traveler as you could be. Um, <clears throat> So these three had to agree, 
uh, and they agreed with the road to Wigan Pier. Uh, so <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things which people get wrong about Orwell is that they, they observe the fact that he says some nasty things about the communists in the second half of the road to Wigan Pier. And they observed that he kept on saying nasty things about the communists for the rest of his life. And so they missed the big change that took place in his ideological outlook in May and June 1937. So what happened was this, uh, this coming out of the next big turning point in Orwell's life. Um, Orwell handed in the manuscript for the road to Wigan Pier. Uh, and then he left for Spain. He went to fight in Spain. Now, this was the Spanish Civil War. The, the, gov the elected government, we call the Republicans, and the right-wing um, anti-Republicans, uh, we call the Nationalists. The left always calls them fascists, but that's not quite accurate. Uh, so it was a civil war between the Nationalist rebels led by military officers and uh, the government which had been elected uh, in early uh, 1936, um, <clears throat> which was a popular front government. It, in other words, it was a combination of communists and other leftists. Although that, the communists were very tiny at the beginning, but they grew very, very rapidly. So Orwell went to fight in Spain. Uh, and the story of what happened to him is... So it's, it's something which most, right, most commentators on Orwell misunderstand and get wrong. Uh, Orwell wanted, you couldn't just turn up in Spain and say, hey, I'm a Brit, I'd like to fight for the Republicans. And they, they would look at you and probably put you in jail for, for six months and to, 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 for you to call up. Uh, you know, I mean, basically, you had to have a letter of introduction from a left wing group. So, um, so Orwell spoke to Strachey, who oh, Strachey was an old Etonian as well, so, so, so. it goes, to, it goes uh, without saying that old, old Etonians, uh, apart from running the country and running the world, uh, it always hit it off. Uh, so Strachey fixed Orwell up with an interview with Harry Pollitt, the leader, leader of the, one of the two leaders, the worker, worker lead, the leader of the British Communist Party. There were two leaders, there was Palmer Dutt, who was the intellectual leader, and there was Harry Pollitt, who was the worker leader. And um, <clears throat> so Orwell met Harry Pollitt and, Harry po and asked for a letter for, of introduction so that he could join the International Brigade, which was fighting in Spain. And Harry Pollitt said, well, uh, will you give me your, your undertaking that uh, you will join the International Brigade and fight for the International Brigade? And Orwell said, no, I won't. We can go into it. If anybody's interested, we can go into the reasons. So, <coughs> Pollitt, and Pollitt, being working class and not an old Italian, didn't hit it up with Orwell. Uh, so Orwell uh, left without a letter of introduction. So he then went to the ILP, which was a big, a, a small British socialist group, but had a big historical importance because they had been the people who had started the Labour Party, but essentially it's the ILP the independent Labour Party, uh, but still existed at this time, and still had a bigger membership in the Communist Party. Uh, so, so Orwell got a letter of introduction from the ILP instead of from the Communist Party. Uh, and as a result, he found himself going to join not the International Brigade, which was controlled by the Communist Party, but the POUN militia, which was controlled by this little dissident Marxist party called the POUM. Um, and they were, they were of, any, of any significance in Catalonia. Uh, so Orwell went to Catalonia uh, and um, signed up to fight for the POUM militia. Now, <clears throat> this is the point that most people don't understand. From the point where he arrived in Spain until May 3rd, 1937. Orwell was a communist fellow traveler. Um, and Orwell didn't like the fact that he was in the trenches in Aragon, which is to the west of Catalonia, 
because partly because it was very, a very inactive part of the front. He wanted to see some action. Uh, and partly because Madrid was the really glamorous uh, part of the war. Uh, and also partly because Orwell swallowed the Communist Party line of the time. What the Communist Party was saying was this. This wasn't necessarily, didn't necessarily reveal their true intentions, but this is what they were saying. They were saying, uh, we mustn't alienate foreigners by saying that this is a revolutionary war. We must subordinate everything to defeating the fascists, meaning the nationalists, um, and we must end the revolutionary excesses which had uh, prevailed uh, in uh, the months up to this point when the Communist Party became <coughs> very influential. Um, and um, we must keep emphasizing that this is a democratic, uh, bourgeois democratic uh, system that is fighting against fascism. But this was in line with the Popular Front ideology of the time. And Orwell completely swallowed this line. Uh, he thought that what the POUM people were saying um, about this, we've got to, we can only win the war by winning the revolution. Uh, we must continue with the revolutionary acts that had been going on a few months before Orwell got there. Uh, Orwell thought that was crazy, and he agreed with the Communist Party line. So, all the time he was fighting in Aragon, uh, he was planning to leave and go and fight in Madrid for the International Brigade, and he wanted to take as many of these militiamen with him as he could. Um, so that was his plan. Uh, now something happened to change that plan and to completely change his ideas on a number of subjects. And that happened on May 3rd of 1937. See, what happened was this. Orwell took a short period of leave that was due to him, and he took this leave in Barcelona, which is the big city that is in the northeast of Spain. It's the only big city. So, and his wife had got a job in the office of the POUN, and so she was in Barcelona. So he went to Barcelona, and his plan was, at this point, to um, take some other POUN militiamen with him uh, and go to Madrid and fight for the international region. Now, if he had done that, he would have been killed, because partly because the fighting was much more fierce in Madrid, and partly because he would have talked back to the commissars, the Soviet bosses, who were actually running the show. This was a completely and utterly controlled by Moscow. Um, and uh, if you hear someone died as a martyr in the Spanish Civil War, you should have a, uh, always have a certain amount of skepticism. They were probably shot in the back of the head by a commissar for talking back or for questioning the party line. Anyway, so Orwell would certainly have been killed. Um, now, <clears throat> There was a delay in Orwell's plans. Orwell was huge. He got grew very tall. He got big hands and big feet. Uh, and it, if he wanted boots, they had to be specially made. So he, he, his boots were wearing out. He needed a, a new pair of boots. They had to be specially made. So this delayed things a bit. So when he when he woke up in the morning and sat down to breakfast, no doubt, on May 3rd, 1937, his outlook was that of a fellow traveling a communist fellow traveler. Uh, he wanted to get to Madrid, where the real action was. Um, but then what happened in Barcelona on May 3rd, 1937, was that street fighting broke out. And the street fighting broke out between the anarchists and the assault guards who were paramilitary police controlled by the right wing of the Socialist Party, which was being manipulated by the Communist Party. <laughs> it sounds complicated, but it's really quite straightforward. The, the government of the Republic was in Valencia, uh, and, um, uh, and it was coming more and more under Communist influence. So the Communists were the only people who would give military aid to the Republic. And, this, and uh, they were, we say give military aid. All the gold of Spain's reserves were shipped to Moscow. So it's hundreds of millions of dollars worth of gold were shipped to Joseph Stalin, who was no doubt gratified, but then started complaining it wasn't enough. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, so basically, this, in, this helps to account for the rapid growth of the Communist Party and their influence. 
Also, the fact that they were putting this apparently moderate, sensible line on the, on the war and, and ending the revolutionary excesses also won them a lot of support among the Spanish middle class. So, so this fighting that broke out, one of the things you have to understand, when, I, when we say anarchists, this isn't a tiny group. The, the, the main trade union federation in Spain, the CNT, was an anarcho-syndicalist controlled entity. So, um, anarchists were, there were millions of, of people who ostensibly were anarchists in Spain, and especially in Catalonia. So this was a big deal. Uh, and what, what happened was that the, um, the assault guards tried to retake the public buildings in Barcelona, which had been occupied by the CNT. Uh, and so you had this street fighting. We're talking about street fighting with rifles and grenades. Um, and Orwell found himself, and this is where Orwell makes the comment, whenever you see the working man up against his natural enemy, the policeman, you know which side you're on. And of course he meant you're on the side of the working man against the policeman. Um, so it's not entirely clear whether that day and the next few days alone would have brought such a complete change in Orwell's outlook. What did help to bring about the complete change in Orwell's outlook was that the Communist Party disseminated very cleverly and very effectively a totally inaccurate picture of what had gone on in Barcelona. Um, and they made it sound as though there had been an anarchist uprising against the Republic. And therefore, therefore objectively, pro-fascist, right? Because if you, if, you, uh, if you have an uprising against your own side, you favor the other side. So it's a very short distance from that to the idea that you're actually in the pay of the fascists. And this is what the Communist Party said. They said that the, the anarchists were in the pay of the fascists. Um, it's completely untrue. No, no evidence has ever turned up to support this. Um, and actually, they also said the POUM, because they liked, the Communist Party liked giving a big role to the POUM because they could call the POUM Trotskyist. And this is the period where Stalin's paranoia about Trotskyism is, become, is expanding like crazy. Uh, and the, the Communist parties all over the world are becoming hysterical about Trotskyism. And so basically what this came to mean was that anybody who criticizes the Communist Party or the Soviet Union in any way from the left is the worst kind of enemy because they are Trotskyists in the pay of Hitler and Franco. Though this was the Communist Party line. Um, so the result of all this was, especially the misrepresentation of this, was that Orwell became converted from being a fellow traveling generic popular front socialist to being a revolutionary anti-Stalinist. So he essentially accepted the views that were being promulgated by the POUM and by the, by the leaders of the ILP in Britain at the time. So he, got, he managed to get back, there's a sort of narrow escape from the, from the murderous, uh, murderous communist-controlled police. But he managed, to, he and his wife managed to get back to England. And then he found in England that all kinds of people he thought would publish his writings exposing what had really happened in, in uh, <coughs> Catalonia uh, <coughs> were not doing so. Uh, they refused to do so. And the New Statesman was the central kind of literary authority of the British left. It was the thing that all left wing. All people of a middle-class intellectual left-wing labor kind of disposition would buy the New Statesman every week and read it. Uh, and they, the New Statesman decided that they would not permit any, anything in their pages to reflect this anti-communist view of the struggle in Spain, even in their correspondence columns. They would, they would just complete blackout on this. And, and, they, and the communists managed to control certain entirely bourgeois newspapers like the News Chronicle and get them to do, take the same line. However, it wasn't a complete blackout because there were certain papers that did, did allow uh, the truth to come out. So, so as a result of this, Orwell has, he has two conversions. 
a year apart. First of all, mid-1936, he converts from anti-socialist to socialist. He remains a socialist for the rest of his life. That doesn't change. But now, in a, a year later, May, June, 1937, he converts to being a revolutionary anti-Stalinist. Um, and um, everything he writes for the next couple of years fits this revolutionary anti-Stalinist kind of um, view. Now, you might think that, you see, one of the things that people don't understand about Orwell is that when he was converted to a point of view, typically, he swallowed the whole package. He wasn't someone who used his critical faculties a lot to say, well, I accept this much of it, but I don't accept these bits here. He, he accepted the whole anti-Stalinist um, revolutionary point of view, which included what's now loosely called pacifism, including opposition to any war between bourgeois nations. So this meant opposition to the coming war with Germany. So from June 1937 until August 1939, Orwell is preaching this revolutionary anti-Stalinist view, which is the same view held by the leaders of the ILP, probably not by most of the rank and file, but certainly by the leaders, um, and it's the same view that had been held by the POUN, who by this time had disappeared into, uh, into jails and mostly were killed. Um, so, so, all, so Orwell accepts this point of view, and it, and it accepts this point of view that you must oppose all wars between capitalist nations. Um, and that means all nations, effectively, since the Soviet Union at this point wasn't involved in any wars. Um, so this goes back to the Communist Manifesto, the working men have no country, right? This is the, this is the traditional Marxist view. And Orwell was not a Marxist, but he shared a lot of Marxist, uh, Marxist uh, views. And he was in the company of a lot of Marxists that he saw eye to eye with on a lot, a lot of issues. So, so this, is, um, this is Orwell's view from, from May, uh, 30, May, June 37 until August 39. He's putting this view, and, and he's... Now, let me just explain to you just how committed he was to this view. Um, he wrote to people and said, or he wrote to at least one person and said, we must form an underground opposition to sabotage the war when it starts. Uh, and he, they had a little exchange of letters, and Orwell said, well, of course we have an open opposition to the war, but just in case we get suppressed and have to go underground, we should make plans now for this illegal opposition to the war. This is the war against Germany, see? So, so we're dealing here with the sort of narrow left view. And the narrow left Thank view you. would be like this. The First World War was a terrible slaughter that accomplished nothing. And the British working class were conned into supporting the British capitalists because it was supposed to be a war against Prussian militarism. Well, now they're doing the same trick and they're trying to con us into a war against fascism. And we won't be conned. So we're going to be opposed to the war even though we don't like Hitler. Uh, so this, is th this was their position. Um, and, uh, you know, what happened then was, of course, as, as, the, as the, we go into 1938-39, what was, what was the major peace party in Britain? Which party, which political party was the peace party? Well, of course, it was Sir Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists. They were the peace party. And um, so Orwell says in one of his letters, uh, I can only hope that Mosley will have the guts and the sense to stand out against this war hysteria. <laughs> right? So he's identifying his own interest with the British Union of Fascists because they're opposed to a war. Now, <clears throat> in the early morning hours, of August 22nd, 1939. Orwell had a dream. Um, you might think I'm making this up, but it wasn't, it's not made up, and if, it, if it's made up, it was made up by Orwell. <laughs> um, Orwell had a dream, and the dream was that the war had started. Now, the war was actually going to start just over a week later, with Hitler's invasion of Poland, and the British issue of an ultimatum to withdraw from Poland, and then Hitler's refusal, and then declaration of war against Germany, and which automatically brought in France as well as Britain. Uh, 
So Orwell had a dream. He dreamed the war had started. He woke up. Doesn't tell us any other details of what went on in the dream, but he said, I knew when I woke up from this dream that I would be a patriot. I would. Does that mean 10 minutes? Yes. Okay. Uh, I would support my own side. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go against my, my own country. Uh, and um, so from then on, for the rest, for, for, for the rest of the war, for the, for the next week or two, and then the war, uh, Orwell was a ferocious proponent of the war. And he viciously attacked all people who put the kind of argument that he did put <laughs> against the war. Um, now, one of the surprising things about the Second World War was the amount of freedom of speech that was permitted. Uh, so, you know, um, people, pacifists openly propagated their, their, uh, their views. And there was a lot of discussion. I mean, uh, the, the black shirts, the British Union fascists, they were in turn as soon as war broke out. But everybody else, um, was, was people could speak freely. There were meeting, public meetings opposing the war, and they were allowed to go ahead and that sort of thing. Completely different to what had happened in the First World War, where that such thing, such freedom would have been unthinkable. Um, so, oh, one thing, one thing that's uh, ironic about all this is that, or well, had this dream. He decided he would support the war. He came downstairs. And he looked at the newspaper headlines. And the, head, the headline in the newspaper was Ribbentrop's visit to Moscow, which everybody knew. People didn't know the details and took for a few days, and not the full details for weeks or months. But they, it meant a complete rapprochement and alliance between the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. So, so the result of this is that all of the Communist Party switched in opposite Honey, directions on almost the same day. Like, all of them changed from being when I'm busy, it's anti war and so called pacifists. He wasn't a pacifist, he liked the idea of violence, uh, but he was against violence in the cause of the bourgeoisie. But uh, from being anti war to being pro war, uh, while the Communist Party <laughs> suddenly became the Peace Party since the black shirts were all in turn, I guess there was a vacancy for the Communist Party yeah, to be the Peace yeah, Party. So. Now the Communist Party were pro-Hitler, uh, and they, uh, their, their propaganda became uh, the, the only reason we have this war is because of imperialism, especially British imperialism. This was their argument. Um, and um, they could, but Hitler was, of course, constantly offering peace terms. He didn't want to fight a war with Britain and France. He wanted them to come to the table and negotiate with us. He wanted, to, he wanted to do the same trick he'd done many times before, but this time people were not, people had lost patience. Uh, and um, and so, uh, so now the Communist Party is the, is the anti-anti-fascist party, the pro-Hitler uh, party, the pro-peace party. And, and Orwell is, is suddenly, um, uh, extremely jingoistic and strongly supports the, the war. So the, this is this is another example of this sudden uh, <coughs> change. Now, um, just to round things off, I will this the next the last my fifth example of Orwell changing his outlook is not so dramatic and it's not so sudden. We're talking about now what happened to Orwell's views between, let's say, 1942 and 1945, um, where a lot of things changed. First of all, all when Orwell became pro-war, he also preached that the only way to win the war was to have a socialist revolution. So this was Orwell repeatedly said, the only way we, either we lose the war or we have a socialist revolution. Because he had this theory that capitalist countries can't, can't fight a war and win against collectivist countries. Um, so, so, and this was actually quite a popular view uh, that, uh, on the left in Britain, that pe leftists who supported the war would say, uh, without a socialist revolution, or without very radical sweeping reforms at home, uh, we can't win this war. Now, there were no radical sweeping re reforms. Um, and uh, um, it was as difficult to become an officer in the British military 
with a regional accent showing that you were not, showing that you were either lower middle class or working class. Uh, it was as difficult to do that at the end of the war as it was at the beginning. Um, except in the RAF, where all pilots were officers. And when you got into the RAF, uh, you had a regional accent. Usually you were middle, lower middle class. Uh, you lost your lower middle class accent in the course of the war. You ended up talking like biggles. If anybody doesn't know what that means, I'll explain it to you later. Um, so. <clears throat> Um, there were no radical reforms, and uh, the, the British, uh, all, there was no democratization of the war or anything like that. But, uh, so, Orwell had to accept he'd been wrong, because by 1942, it was becoming clear that the war was going against Germany. Now, you might think that, uh, that Orwell could have said, uh, well, when I said that we had to have a revolution to win the war, I meant before Russia and America came into the war. But he didn't say that. He was because after Russia and America had come into the war, he was still saying we cannot win this war without a socialist revolution. Um, but, so the idea that the need for a socialist revolution had been uh, had gone away because we'd been rescued by Russia and America didn't enter his head. Um, uh, and um, there were other signs of changes in his ideas. One of one of his one of the reasons he became. Uh, a socialist was because he became convinced that because of he became convinced of several things that the machine is irresistible we don't like it because we're sensitive people who love literature and the arts uh, and we wish that it wasn't like this but we but it's irresistible and if the machine is irresistible it automatically this is Orwell's thinking it automatically means a centrally directed government regulated society and that kind of society is going to be more effective and more efficient than uh, an old-fashioned capitalist society so this is something that Orwell accepted in middle of 1936 and never went back on that collectivist society is always going to beat a capitalist society so <clears throat> Um, he still thought that in a very abstract way, but it, of course he had to accept that we were winning the war, or the, the anti-German forces were winning the war. Um, and he didn't think that this was crucially due to the Soviet Union, uh, which would be one of view. Um, so he had to accept, as he, sa he says, he says that, you know, I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong. He then goes on to give all kinds of explanations why, why other people were more wrong. Uh, but <laughs> but he said, this course. is a big change in his view. Um, he, and so one thing he he, obs he, he observed, and he starts mentioning, is that <coughs> dictatorship has disadvantages. One of the disadvantages of dictators uh, is that, just from the point of view of the dictator's own goals and objectives, is that they're not subject to criticism. And if they're fallible, uh, they can make a big blunder, uh, and that can subvert their whole purpose. Now, I mean, the obvious case of this is Hitler. You know, Hitler wanted certain things. He wanted the... Uh, um, he sincerely wanted the, the prosperity and expansion of the white race, and particularly the Germans. Uh, but what he did resulted in a tremendous setback for the white race and the Germans. Now, why was that? Well, it was because nobody was able to say, hey, Adolf, <laughs> stop that. Uh, uh, you know, that, that's not a good idea. Almost all the, the decisive things that Hitler did, from the invasion of Poland onwards, uh, were blunders and would have been stopped if somebody else had been authorized to stop it. Um, so, um, this is something that Orwell starts to draw attention to, that democracy has a strength because it always means criticism from multiple directions. Um, and. Um, uh, whether they're expert or non-expert, you get different points of view and they're more likely to get to some kind of viable policy if you allow this uh, discussion. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I should, I'm now, be, I'm now being told uh, that I have to wrap up. So, but my final point would be this, that Orwell, Orwell's implacable hostility to communism, in other words, when we say communism, we're talking about the Soviet Union, Stalinism, uh, uh, became more and more marked towards the end of the war, which means towards the end of his life, because he died in 
January 1950. Um, now, um, you know, the, you, can, you can detect how strongly opposed he is to uh, communism in various ways. Uh, one way that it became controversial long after his death was that he gave a list of people who he had suspected might be communist or have communist sympathies to this secret department in the British government. So this is a Labour government, and we would say a very left-wing Labour government, but it was very anti-communist. Um, you know, they joined NATO, they developed the independent British nuclear deterrent, they fought the communists in Malaya, all, all kinds of anti-communist things, although it's a very left-wing government. Um, and an old girlfriend of Orwell, who, oddly enough, this is... <laughs> this is the basis for a kind of uh, spy story, is the, is the twin sister of the wife of Arthur Kirstler, uh, an, an ex-communist who became a ferocious anti-communist. Um, but Celia Kerwin, her name was, he started feeding her with the, this list he, and the, with information he had on people who he suspected were communists. So in other words, Orwell was prematurely a McCarthyite. Um, and um, I think if he'd lived, he would have supported him. The, uh, Senator McCarthy in his uh, brave attempt to, uh, to fight off America's enemies. So I think at that point I've said enough to arouse some controversy. Yes. Before we make an announcement or uh, about ask, sure. let's have a show of hands of who wants to give a rebuttal so we can manage the time here. Because uh, if we have eight or nine people, everybody's going to have like two minutes for a rebuttal tonight. So we're way late. Okay. All right. Uh, then we'll take 10, 15 minutes worth of uh, questions and then we'll go to rebuttals. So, two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, the speaker will answer your question. All right. Over here. First one. All right. I never quite understood why Stalin was afraid of, so afraid of Trotsky. And what it was he thought Trotsky was going to do? Trotsky was hiding in Mexico. Well, he had Trotsky killed, he had so he even sent someone to Mexico to do it. So, um, but why did he do that? Why was he so frightened of um, Trotsky? Uh, that's an interesting question, and it's not just that he was afraid of Trotsky. I mean, uh, Stalin's paranoia, to to uh, for, for the sake of a simple. Word uh, was all encompassing. Uh, he had all kinds of people put to death that um, you would think he, he needn't have had to put to death. And there were, and most of the people who Stalin put to death were people who were totally loyal. Um, uh, so, the, for some insight on this, it's worth reading uh, Stephen Kopkin's book, the first volume of his three-volume book on, on Stalin, uh, which is um, very good uh, and shows you the kind of person Stalin was. But, he, but I think Kotkin agrees that there is some mystery here. You know, um, if you contrast Stalin with Hitler, there was nothing like this on Hitler's side. I mean, Hitler, um, if someone had a military defeat, Hitler didn't say, oh, he must, he must be conspiring with the enemy and we'll have him killed. He might retire him and put someone else in his place, uh, but, you, but he would retire him with full armies, you know. Um, and even even Rommel, who was conspiring to some extent against all this, talking to people who were conspiring, uh, was let off as long as he committed suicide. His family would be looked after, that kind of thing. Whereas Stalin, his, his paranoia was all consuming. Um, and um, I suppose what, all one can say is that he was so powerful, he lived in a world of his own that no one dared enter and criticize. Um, and that um, he, got, he got into a habit of thought that had stood him well in his earlier life, is suspect everyone. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, he just made this a principle. So uh, I, but it, you, you, you know, it, it's a question about Stalin's psychology. Jonathan, in the back. Yeah. Yeah. David, thank you for your talk this evening. You said that George Orwell uh, is a, 
uh, someone who was against progress, industry, and modern technology. Could you cite some examples of this throughout his life? Yes. Uh, I should say that this is at its most extreme in the second half of the road to Wigan Pier. And he moderates this a bit as the years go by. Um, and he moderates it and then goes back on it. He reverses himself. You know, so I've, I've been through everything Orwell has written that has survived many times. And um, he will write something saying uh, the machine is the enemy. And then uh, a few months later he'll write something saying we don't have to worry about the machine. It's totalitarianism we have to worry about. And then a few months after that he'll be writing something else saying oh, the machine is the enemy. You know, when Orwell was a child, one of the big literary hits was, the, the, the author of it was dead, but it was a posthumous hit, was uh, Erwan by Samuel Butler. And um, in that story, it was a very interesting story with all kinds of uh, fascinating things, but one of the things in that story is that it's this, it's this society that exists cut off from the rest of the world beyond the, mount beyond the mountains in New Zealand. Right? Um, and they have a law in that society that it's a capital offense to use any piece of equipment or machinery that was invented after a certain date. So you could be put to death for wearing a wristwatch, for example, because it would have been invented after that date. Um, and, um, and, you know, also in, um, I mean, Samuel Butler is the origin of all these kind of Terminator kind of stories where the, um, the machines are going to be conscious and they're going to not just being, have inconvenient, ugly things about them, but they're going to start conspiring against us and take over. Right? That's, it. That's all in Samuel Butler. But um, Orwell says quite late in the, for in the 1940s, maybe we need a law like that to, st to stop technological progress. So, um, if you look at if you look at the if you look at my book where I have a, a section devoted to this, you'll see all, lots of quotations from Orwell. Uh, and um, I have I have a. Um, a, a chapter called the post-socialist and a chapter called the reactionary and in both of those chapters you'll see that uh, I give, give uh, supporting evidence for everything I say about Orwell I don't just make it up you know um, can you kind of make it more concise we're going to ask okay yeah all right you oh, have time time to okay. question well, this lady over here please okay my question is um, you mentioned about Stalin, what about Lenin? Did he was familiar with Lenin, yeah, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin? You know, yes. Le Lenin? Lenin, yes. He, yeah, he, he was familiar with Lenin, too, Stalin oh, and yeah. Lenin? Oh, all well knew about Lenin, yes. Yes. So he read all, he read Spain Revolution and all that. Right. Uh, Is uh, something wrote about Lenin? Uh, he does, I, I can't recall him. He, he, he does say some things about Lenin. One thing he says that Lenin may have been fortunate in dying too soon. If he, you know, if he'd lived, he would have. He would have. Uh, one of the things Orwell was very definite about was if the, the Soviet Union was on a fixed path, uh, and that if Lenin had survived, or if Trotsky had beaten Stalin for the leadership, things wouldn't have pro would probably not have been very different. This is, so this is something Orwell said. Repeated. Um, and by the way, by the way, that that is that is something that people misunderstand about um, Animal Farm. Snowball is, among other things, stands for Trotsky, and Orwell makes very clear that Snowball is in on the corruption of the animalist revolution, and that if he had if Snowball had won over Major um, or Napoleon rather, uh, it would then uh, <clears throat> it wouldn't have been any better. Uh, but you see, when you see adaptations like cartoons and things around the farm, they change this to make it pro trotskyist <laughs> and to make it out that Snowball uh, was, was a whole, genuinely hopeful uh, alternative. Man in the blue shirt here. Go ahead. What would Orwell's views been towards the Tories and Winston Churchill? Uh, well, he was very impressed with the fact that Churchill had won the war, so to speak. Um, and he, he, you know, he, he, he said some very nice things about Churchill after the war and at the end of the war. Uh, so, uh, but of course he was, uh, he was still committed, he st Orwell was still committed to the view that um, everything should be nationalized, everything should be owned by the government and everybody should work for the government and everybody should get roughly the same pay. 
that was Orwell's definition of socialism, and that, this, and that there should be civil liberties and democracy as well. Uh, but but uh, so so he thought he thought he always thought of people who defended private property as being uh, like people whose days were numbered because the tendency of modern industry was towards this government control system. Bye. Bye. Yeah, uh, David, when you say that uh, uh, Orwell said, you know. We don't have to fear the machine, we have to fear totalitarianism. By machine, you mean automation and technology? Yeah, but Progress, not, yeah. not, the, not like the, Orwell the democratic does, Orwell rarely uses the term technological progress or technology, which other people at the time were using it, but, but he didn't. He always spoke about mechanical progress, the machine, usually just the machine. Okay. Neil. Yeah. Um, you, you made a remark in passing uh, to the to the effect of socialism kind of peaked in the 1880s and 90s, I think you said. Um, among intellectuals, yes. Oh, okay. Because Credibility of, among intellectuals, yes. Oh, all right. Because I, th you know, in this country, I had thought that there was a strong current up until World War One and the Red Scare. Um, what what period or or what emblematic events are you pointing to as as the peak of socialism. Oh, uh, I think I think what you see is you see leading intellectuals, leading writers who turn against socialism. Uh, Croce in Italy says, uh, "I think socialism is dead." You know, they, they they begin to write it off as something passé, something that you're very naive if you believe in. Um, and I mean, uh, what? The sort of example, the English-speaking world lags a bit behind the continent in some of these developments, but one, one example would be the way intellectuals in general view H.G. Wells. Now, uh, up until about 1920, 1925, intellectuals thought of H.G. Wells as someone who was not only a, a great entertaining writer of fiction, but also a prophet of the future, he was a socialist and all the rest of it. And so basically that a very positive. In the 20s, although the public, the book-buying public still thinks of H.G. Wells that way, the intellectuals, the leading intellectuals, really turn against H.G. Wells. He's this, he's this um, as partly because H.G. Wells started writing very positive, glowing accounts of the socialist future, books like Men Like Gods, uh, and so on, Modern Utopia. Uh, and so the, in, by 1930, yeah, no, no. this has been complete. The if you're an intellectual, a literary intellectual. You despised H.G. Wells, and you thought that um, you thought that um, you, you thought that uh, you know H.G. Wells was terrible, uh, and uh, at best was just a, was just a facile popular entertainer. Now, uh, and one of the people who, who trades on this movement in opinion is Aldous Huxley, because Radio World was seen as an opposition to H.G. Wells and his view of the glowing future, and of course. The society in a, in a great new world, although people very rarely say this, is a socialist one. Private property has been abolished, right? Everything's controlled by the state. Um, and um, so, uh, it, this is, the, meanwhile, of course, in the 1890s and the 1910s, or the, the first decade and so on, uh, the socialist movements in Europe are growing. Okay. Right? So the Social Democratic Party is getting more and more votes. Um, okay. But uh, intellectuals are definitely, and there, there are certain key things as well, you know, there is uh, Bernbeck's refutation of Marx demonstrating that <coughs> you cannot reconcile volume three with volume one of capital, basically. They're irreconcilable. Yeah, Pat's, got the last, Pat's got the last question, then we're going to rebuttals. Yeah, when... What about uh, my question? Uh, hey. we're, we got other people got questions and we're out of time. Uh, he's, he's not okay. Make it quick. Pat first. By the 1950s or so, when all of the uh, drivel, uh, the Communist Party propaganda has been, you know, kind of swept aside, um, was Russia interested in the furtherance of world communism, or was this just another form uh, of Russian nationalism uh, dressed in new colors? Okay, that, that's an interesting question, um, and um, I think that all, let, let's stick with Orwell here. Uh, Orwell, in, when, he, when he starts writing, uh, when he becomes really tremendously anti-communist in 1937, uh, he starts writing about communism 
See, there, 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 for a long time there are these two theories. They're cynical politicos who are using uh, Marxist ideas to keep power. And then the other argument would be they're victims of an ideology. They really are true believers, right? Um, and so Orwell at one point is generally supports the first theory that they're just cynical, um, you know, they're just cynical, uh, power-hungry people who are using these socialist ideas. But then, because he read people like like um, John Plamenatz, whose books were coming out in the 1940s, he changed, and he, he, and he began to see it as more of true believing ideology. But it, they were not, uh, and this of course is what has come out, you know, now all the documents are out. Um, we know that uh, the leaders of the Communist Party, you know, the, they used to think when it all comes out, we'll find that there's nudge, nudge, wink, wink. We really put one over on them, you know, the, uh, um, uh, for the sake of Mother Russia. But no, they all believed it. They all believed in Marxism, Leninism. Um, you know, it's all all the way down. It's Leninism all the way down. So, um, uh, so the, uh, the theory that it was just power-hungry people, you manip cynically manipulating these uh, ideologies, I think, has been refuted. It, that basically it was uh, just like Islam was. You know, it was a, a, a movement of true belief. It was a, a genuinely evangelizing, proselytizing movement that wanted power. Last question over well, here. Uh, G G G uh, JFK admired Hitler and the Nazi party, uh, the, the, the Na uh, uh, Nazi Germany in the 1930s. His father. What would Orwell him. think about that? I don't know what Orwell would have thought about JFK, really. I mean, you, you, uh, aren't we thinking about JFK's father, Joseph Kennedy? Yeah, right. right. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there, there were some sympathizers in, in uh, America and Britain for the Nazi party. Orwell didn't make a lot of, pay a lot of attention to that because they were very few. Well, I mean, he didn't pay so much attention to the United States as he paid to Britain. Uh, there were probably fewer in Britain than in the United States. I mean, if you're in the United States, you've got this great expanse okay. of water. What do you care <laughs> if the German part all over there okay. expands a bit? You know? But if you're if you're sitting right next to it, you're more you're more nervous. Right? Okay, <laughs> we're gonna cut it off now. No more okay. questions. What? We're going to rebuttals. It's now 8:02. Come up for your rebuttal. Raise your hand and come up if you have something else to say. We're way beyond the time tonight for rebuttals to start. So right. let's have a show of hands. Let's Give thank David. Let's have a show of hands of who wants to rebuttal because that's only how many we're going to have. We we'll won't have people coming up here after the last speaker, one more and one more. We're going to get out of here on time. Okay, hold your hands up if you're going to give a rebuttal. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, and eight. That's All right. eight people. So we'll have eight rebuttals. I'm going to count them and we'll cut off the time. Thank you. How much time? Three minutes or four minutes? Everybody gets two minutes. No, we can go. I don't need the whole two minutes. I wanted to, to add um, perhaps a footnote um, that I, I don't know if it was made explicitly clear. The word communist in the 1930s meant Stalin and Russia and his various machines, organizations, influence, and whatnot. Um, Stalin uh, was working to undermine the Spanish Revolution from the beginning. He robbed them, he betrayed them, um, because if he is the one true revolution and he doesn't own them, then they can't be a true revolution, which has been a, a Marxist, Bolshevik uh, attitude in a lot of places. But, and P-O-U-M was Trotskyite, which, which adds all kinds of political um, complications. But communist is, is not a general term. It, in, in, in this context, it's, it's Stalin and his internal and external arms. Okay, next. Okay, George Orwell, two minutes. Uh, impossible. Uh, 
This is from the authorized biography of George Orwell by Michael Sheldon. Great book. Everybody get it if you can. Uh, George Orwell uh, took another year for him to uh, shift his writing to more uh, political writing. The deciding factor was his recognition that there was only one way to oppose fascism effectively. Socialism, he wrote in 1936, is the only real enemy that fascism has to face. He concluded that the capitalist imperialist governments would not have the heart to stand up to Hitler and Mussolini. They would try appeasement for as long as possible. Eventually these governments would pay dearly for that policy, but he thought that nothing would keep them from pursuing it. They were not serious about stopping the fascists because he believed they had too much in common with them. Fascism, after all, is only a development of capitalism, he wrote in 1937. And the mildest democracy, so-called, is liable to turn into fascism when the pinch comes. Uh, how many people in this room think we're kind of living through that example right now in the United States of America? Okay, we've got a half a minute to go. Uh, this is the end of uh, 1984, uh, when he uh, writes that uh, uh, I don't know, i got 10 seconds. Well, anyway, he loved, he loved Big Brother. You know, Smith loved Big Brother. Uh, 125 million people last year decided for either imperialism light or imperialism strong. Uh, we have a lot of reading of many authors, including George Orwell, to learn to oppose Big Brother. Thank you, David. You got two minutes, said. We know what this is going to say. Take me 30 seconds. Uh, when they had the uh, revolution in Russia, one thought it wouldn't succeed unless Germany came in and had a revolution there. But he didn't understand the uh, situation in Germany. They didn't have a strong socialist party that a lot of people adhered to at that particular time. And they thought of Germany as an industrial power would have the basis for socialism. And that's what happened as far as that's concerned. And then the party itself actually ran the country. And it wasn't democratic. The people at that time, including myself, didn't understand that. And um, that's one of the reasons it went down, is they couldn't provide clothing and proper food to everybody, and the um, inadequate housing at that time in Russia. <laughs> and that's uh, why uh, Gorbachev, became a counter-revolutionary and allowed capitalism to take place with a lot of um, other communist officials. So the Communist Party at that particular time was uh, riddled with opportunism. And that's one of the reasons it didn't succeed. And Marx thought the only way he could really have socialism was if an industrial power came, came in and they were able to succeed because they had the basis okay. that is industrial industry. All right, Sid, your time's up. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Sid. It's up there. Okay. Parables of peanuts. Lucy and Linus, he's the little boy with the blanket. Lucy comes up to him. You think you're so smart. I'm going to teach you a lesson. Give me that blanket. She grabs the blanket, tears it up. He says, I'm going to tear it up into a million pieces. She tears it up. Now, what are you going to do about it? So Linus is just sitting there and he says, 
<clears throat> Lucy, you realize that was your blanket. No, no. That's it. <laughs> okay. Next. <laughs> Uh, two minutes. Hi, my name is Ellen Corley, and um, I'm not even that one back. sure what I'm going to say, but um, thank you for the talk. And uh, I thought when what I read, you know, the intro that I was going to disagree with you more um, in terms of being libertarian, but it, it I agreed with um, with everything you said. Uh, one question I. I have or a theory of all this is about the CIA and how they, um, you know, became like James Burnham and uh, the neocons did a kind of secret. Um, uh, they were all Trotskyists and then they became CIA. Uh, but there was a, a kind of confusion in the media, false propaganda, misinformation, and it. It seems to me to explain a lot of what Orwell was going back and forth. I mean, I think he does what I would have done. Um, you know, which is I just don't want war, or I don't want corruption, or totalitarian, Big Brother, inequality. Uh, you know, because one thing I read this Anthony Sutton is that um, the Russians, the Zionist neocon Russians, were working with the Americans after World War One, to finance both sides of the war. And so it would be confusing to constantly, you know, is this communism, is this socialism? Um, but and one question I have, if you could answer, is Trotsky, uh, there's, I heard somebody say that there was a theory that Trotsky was gonna raise an army based on people in New York and, uh, you know, pr proceed this deep state takeover of the world, um, which, I used to, I wanted to believe Trotsky was a noble hero, but um, I, uh, I think we're always divided. And, you know, Orwell's a good example of someone who, um, I do think Marxism, and your time I, I think he would is be a Marxist. Up. I don't know why you said he wasn't. And your time is up. You. Mm -hmm. All right, next, okay. two minutes. My name is Doug Binkley, very abbreviated uh, rebuttals here tonight. Uh, I mentioned before uh, about uh, how what I gathered from uh, Orwell uh, in my uh, readings of him was that we need to resist the possibility of a totalitarian state coming. Let's not worry about the isms. Uh, I'm a member of a group that says refuse fascism. I think that uh, uh, the totalitarianism um, kind of thing that leans right is generally called fascism. And of course the worst example of it was the Nazis. Uh, now, Orwell was, a, Orwell was a complicated person, but uh, we have his great legacy to us of the book 1984, uh, which popularized this notion that uh, the technological state could become incredibly uh, controlling of people, brainwashing them in a certain way, and of course, whitewashing the past, as I mentioned, as uh, change, trying to change history uh, and trying to change the news that we receive, and e either controlling it or calling actual true news fake news, like trying to deny climate change, things like that, and the suppressing the, um, the regular uh, media, um, sometimes called the corporate media, and of course it is, a, it is a media that's less than perfect, but it's all we've got at this point. Um, we have to resist uh, this fascist leaning. Uh, we have to all be out on November 4th for the protest at uh, Federal Plaza anytime afternoon. Please show up. Um, and um, uh, let's not get all bogged down in all of these isms and uh, minute details about uh, Stalinism versus Trotskyism, etc., etc. Let's resist the true danger to our democracy and our way of life, and that is Trump and the Republicans that are enabling him. Okay, I'll go, Who, who's next? Our waitress, Heather, is next. She wants to uh, make a, an announcement before everybody starts heading for the exits, because we have a problem tonight. All right, Heather. Hi, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I know you guys are up here for the best service, um, but as you can see, we were quite crowded tonight. I did my best, I put waters over there, I put coffee on the back table so that everyone could get, without sticking their hands in glasses, 
on the coffee pots and the water stations because that is against health code. I've asked many times to please not do that, but I don't know if people aren't hearing or if it's like a five minute memory retention, but please, water is for people that have the certificate for the sanitation. Um, and also tonight there's been problems with the other waitresses saying that people are pulling the plates. I know the busboys aren't the greatest. I work with them daily, I get it. But, you know, the plates going on other servers' tables causes them to have dirty tables, which people can't be seated at. Um, I'm sorry, but you know, when it's busy, we do our best to pull the plates. We do our best to get the orders, refills, etc. but you know, you have to be a little bit patient with me too. Um, so if you can, please make note of the coffee on the back table that is perfectly able to be used and pumped at any time. There's usually five or six waters up here if anybody needs water. I try to put it there. Ice tea's even up there so nobody I has to go bother the bus boys, etc., other waitresses. Please, I'm trying to do my best. It's like this, it's really busy. I'm doing the best. Let's they give Heather a hand. All right, I'll go. Okay. Two minutes. What killed communism? Um, <clears throat> free marketers will tell you it was the free market system. Uh, some religion or religionists will tell you that it was because of the fact that everyone prayed seven times a day. Uh, Sorry. My feeling is that what really killed communism, if it ever had a chance, was the fact that its adherents loved to sit around in corners like one big circle jerk, you should excuse the expression, as they uh, discussed theory while the world was burning. Um, you know, I'm one of these guys, I'm basically, if I'm to be described as any kind, in any political uh, loophole, uh, I would uh, say that I am a Roosevelt, Kennedy, Truman type of Democrat. Basically, I think a lot of Americans like myself aren't so much concerned with the theory behind it or the doctrine behind it. If we want to hear doctrine, we'll go to the churches of our choice. I think, I think what's happening is that you get a lot of people that are tied up fighting over theory and not about getting bridges built, not about getting roads built, not about uh, doing something to eliminate poverty. Some of, us, some of us are of the feeling that we don't particularly care what label you want to put on it as long as it gets done. People are hungry. Uh, people are not having an opportunity to get a decent education. Uh, roads in many parts of the world are absolutely horrific. And yet you have these people sitting around wondering whether one is a Fabian socialist or uh, any other kind of socialist. And when the real issue is how soon can that bridge get done? How soon can that road get done? How soon can we all stop sitting around in a circle, uh, staring at each other's navels when up. maybe we need to sit down and dig some ditches? Thank you. Okay. Next. Okay. Well, eight months into a Trump Pence regime, how's that mission message working out for you? Uh, on November 4th, Okay, uh, some smarter minds than myself came up with this idea. They're spread out all across the United States. On November 4th, there's going to be a general strike, a general protest across the entire United States, United States at the same time. And uh, the whole, this, I have these in the back there. You can take one. They're looking for more volunteers. They want to up the ante. Uh, we cannot tolerate a fascist America for 38 months. This is a month away. Uh, if you haven't made any of the marches, that's the reason why you don't know about this, okay? Uh, if you expect somebody else to march for you, well, then you're going to get more Trump and more Pence and more fascist uh, obstruction. So the whole, the whole uh, idea behind this is that uh, to get a, a, an extreme protest across the United States, force it on the media, and then they have nonstop pickets. She knows about it. 
Um, they have non-stop picketing, uh, 24 hours a day, rotating. You'd sign up for it at, all across the USA. Of course, I mean, it's like you'd have to sign up for a certain time. But they want to keep this kind of like what went on in Occupy. So it, these are, this explains the whole thing. Uh, you can donate because they do need money to, to run this, to bail people out of jail, to get water and other things. Uh, but this this is it. You can join, or you don't have to give your name. You can just go down there with a sign in March like this. So that's November fourth. So uh, uh, if you want to more right. want to continue this fascist regime, then uh, stay home. So Very good. Yes. Okay. See you in the fourth. Just want to thank our speaker once again. Thank you. Thanks again. David, I'll be very quickly. Uh, when you refer to Lenin, please use the term comrade Lenin. <laughs> and I just want to talk about my friend Butler here, who says, no, you should not question anything. Just keep your head down and let the guy, the guy tells you to dig a ditch. So you keep your head down and you do what he told to do. And don't be like a socialist and say, hey, maybe you ought to dig a ditch once in a while, pal. And maybe I don't have to do it. And maybe our entire children don't have to do it, you know. But no, that's a good idea. Keep your head down. And uh, don't ask any questions, you know, all right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Uh, I'll just do what they right. tell you to do, pal. Okay. Yeah, sh again, shovel some more. Yeah. Yeah. Your hole is a deep All right. Time yeah. in two minutes. He wants to go. Keep your head down. Yeah. I'll The problem is with Trotsky and all these socialistic schemes are you're dead wrong. What you need to understand is that capitalism has been delivering the goods for well over 300 years. And if you really want to get rid of the poor in this country, in the world, you need to empower them with business ideals, property rights, and more things. According to Hernando de Soto, about, in his book called The Mystery of Capital, the poor own a lot of assets, but they don't have legal title. That means they can't do business with other people except their local networks. They can't mortgage their homes. They can't do a lot of things that normal businesses can do here in the United States. And a lot of times they're risk takers, they're in here. So let's face it, people are better off working for themselves, maybe hiring others, starting their own businesses, because there's a lot of entrepreneurism out there, and let it flourish by letting the tools of capitalism flow downhill into the poor. Well, Charlie, the only reason the plantation exists is that once they get more efficient, it puts more people to work and, and it industrializes the country. All right. I have an hour. Is that right? Okay. Um, I'll just comment on some of these things. Um, yeah, it's true that when we talk about communism in the 30s and 40s, we're talking about Stalinism. As a matter of fact, um, Orwell um, sometimes uh, used the word communism favorably to talk about a very distant future society, which he thought might come about after socialism has been in existence uh, for some time. So there are a few places where Orwell says that ultimately we'll have pure communism and that would be a great thing. Um, but most of the time when I've been using the word communism, I've been using it to refer to the official Stalinist um, system. You know, he went now, what Orwell said about fascism, that changed quite a bit. Um, in, in, as I said, in, the, um, in 1936, he was a fellow traveler. And um, he says, actually, one thing he says in The Road to Wigan Pier is there are some people who... Go ahead, go. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so... It's true that communism means Stalinism when you're talking about the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. Uh, it's also true there is another, the original meaning of communism was a moneyless uh, society, a society without private property, without market exchange. Um, and that was favored by Marx, of course. Um, later it became used to, to denote a distant future society that would 
come about after socialism had been in existence for quite some time. And Orwell sometimes said he was in favor of pure communism, which would uh, arise in the very distant future. So he's, there he's using the word communism in a different sense. <clears throat> now, fascism was, a, was an issue on which Orwell changed his mind. Uh, in 1936, he was uh, a communist fellow traveler. He says in The Road to Wigan Pier uh, that I've heard people who pass resolutions against fascism and communism, uh, i.e. against rats and rat poison. So what he means there is there are some people who say that fascism and communism are just as bad as each other. I'm not one of them. Uh, I think communism is an effective ally, an effective agent against fascism, which is the great evil. Now that's a view that Orwell ceased to hold later. Um, uh, later he came around to the view that one thing you have to understand is that when leftists, 1930s leftists, refer, use the word fascism without qualification, they're usually actually referring to the Third Reich. They're usually referring to National Socialist Germany, which technically was not fascist in the sense that they, they had a different kind of ideology. Um, they said, we're not fascists. That's an Italian thing, and so on. Um, but <clears throat> Orwell used the term mainly to mean German National Socialism. And his view became, by at the latest early 1940, that German National Socialism was rapidly turning into the same kind of society as the Soviet Union. He says this very emphatically, very unequivocally, several times. Um, so, um, however, whatever the reasons why uh, German National Socialism gained power, uh, he's, uh, Orwell saw it as something that was headed in the same direction. And that's why 1984 is aimed at both the Nazi and the Communists, because he saw them as being headed in the same direction. He thought, the, uh, he, thought he was influenced by James Burnham, the managerial revolution, which had the same idea that the Soviet Union is a bit closer to this pure totalitarian system than, than the, um, than the uh, Nazi system which is in turn a bit closer than the Roosevelt's New Deal. Uh, but they're all in going in the same direction, leaving capitalism behind and going towards totalitarianism. So, so Orwell, Orwell accepted this, this kind of view. Um, now, um, Orwell was not a Marxist, and I have a whole section of the chapter all about this. Uh, but no, we don't know that. there were non-Marxist we socialists who shared a lot of the views of Marxists. There's a kind of generic socialism. And it's a type of socialism I call neo-Sansimonianism. Uh, and it's basically the kind of socialism that a lot of people held who were not communists, not Marxists, but it's, co but it's common to Marxists. They have a lot of common views. Their, their, the conception of what a socialist system would look like, ideally, was very similar. Their conception of how to bring it about that is to say, have the government nationalize everything and turn everybody into a government employee. That was essentially similar. Um, so, um, so although not a Marxist, and although constantly saying he's not a Marxist, it's true that Orwell shares a lot of views with the Marxists. Um, uh, or somebody mentioned James Burnham. Or Orwell was actually quite heavily influenced by James Burnham. Uh, and this, can, you, can, you can be... Um, you can be uh, misled because he's often attacking Burnham quite strongly, but actually accepts a lot. Uh, and in fact, you know, the whole setup in 1984 with these three world powers is the setup you have in the, in the managerial revolution. Uh, toward later on, Burnham, Burnham was someone who started out as a communist, then became a Trotskyist, then became right wing. And it, he made the most of the fact that some of his readers didn't know he'd become right wing. So there's this period of ambiguity where he's not letting on to all his readers, uh, unsuspecting readers, just how right wing he is. But it really, James Burnham is the founder of post-war American conservatism, much more than people like Buckley. Um, and he wrote a book called The Struggle for the World in 1947, in which he said, well, what we've got to immediately unify uh, the United States with the British Empire. We've got to have an American empire that is world dominant. We've got to be ready to nuke the Soviet Union before they get the bomb. 
uh, and because th this is a world conspiracy and it's very dangerous and we've got to suppress it. And Orwell reviewed that book, The Struggle for the World, 1947 by James Byrne, and he was basically very sympathetic with a lot of it. But he said, but he, he had various quite interesting arguments for why he didn't swallow the whole thing. And basically he said it's not as urgent as Burnham is saying. We have more time. We have at least 20 years. We don't have to do this right away. Um, and it, one, of the, one of the interesting things he says is, and of course Orwell knew lots of communists uh, and, and, and Trotskyists and people like that. I mean he hung out with leftists all the time. And one of the points he makes is, and this is a very important point, is that the Communist Party always had a very high turnover of membership. Always. Um, the British Communist Party, I think the turnover was never less than 10% a year, and sometimes it was over 30%. So people come into the Communist Party, uh, and they burn out and they leave, they become disillusioned. Uh, but if you read Burnham, you get the idea that there's this army of militant, dedicated, brainwashed soldiers for communism. But Orwell says, no, it's not like that. They're fallible human beings. They're, 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 uh, they give up, you know, they, they, look, they, they, they run out of enthusiasm, they burn out. Uh, and it's, it's, it, basically, I think he puts, he's quite correctly says, we don't have to do all these drastic things uh, in order to combat communism. Um, well, I mean, I, I think the idea that, that um, I must say this, since I'm, I'm a, a skeptic about climate change, which doesn't mean I'm a skeptic that climate change is happening. I'm a skeptic that it's all caused by humans and that it's catastrophic. Um, but um, there is a tendency on the left to use terms like fake news to mean opinions they disagree with. Right? Because what they agree with is incontrovertible, accredited fact. And therefore, anything that contradicts what they agree with is, is, uh, is falsehood or fake news. But of course, there are differences in opinion. Um, and um, the, the climate change is a very controversial uh, area. And it's controversial among climate scientists, although there's a great uh, movement to try and deny that fact in the media by the left. Um, so, um, lastly, I would say this. I'm, I don't uh, agree with most of... Donald Trump's policies, but I do not think that we that what we are seeing is a fascist regime or any movement in the direction of a fascist regime. Um, I don't see I don't see any attempt to to abolish democracy, to create a one-party state, uh, or any of the any of the um, telltale signs of the fascist regime. They don't seem to be a girl. What has happened in the last eight months? Nothing very much. Um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, so uh, it strikes me that Trump's actual policies are extremely moderate. I don't agree with all of them, but they're certainly not fascist. So thank you very much. For those of you that would like to buy a copy, he's got a couple copies left, and he'll be signing them at the table back there. Because uh, we have to move to the back now to let them. Anybody wants a copy of his book? It's twenty-five dollars. I already bought a copy. It looks like a good book. Okay, Kevin, you all for coming. We're out.